you want to know? Well, I've been thinking about you. And I think I'll have to listen. Because... The sun is up, it's a beautiful day. My beginning will be as bright as the sun. Come, won't you come along? And it feels so bright. It's like luck is raining on me. Go and follow your heart. Doesn't matter how far. There is so much love to give. Something's telling me this time. Baby, baby, now I know. Baby, baby, gotta go. There is so much love to give. Something's telling me it's right. When you came to me. Maybe peer. P-I-E-R Bear? Like bear of shoes? Oh, door. You're a door. Oh, you need to be specific. Wait, I think I even told you wrong. Oh, see? Huh? Yeah, you told me wrong, right? Because I already switched yeah. place. It's not bear. It's not fear. <laughs> Navy? Navy, P I E R. Navy, Pier. P. Oh, wow, it's beautiful out there. Wow. I'm excited. I can see. That one, that one is, uh, is working. Wait, we might be able to get on the boat if you want to do that. I don't know where he's going to drop us off. We can, we can make that one, the circle, circle one. You can ride it there. Is it possible to drop us off? Like right where we can get off where these boats are. Yeah. Is that a? Cause I know you guys have restrictions and on what you can do. I appreciate it. Oh my it, god, man. I'm excited here! Thank you so much. If we have time, we'll take a boat, baby. Yay! You have a really because good Because we had idea. a good lift driver, he got us here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's my first time here, so I'm excited. Okay, you want like over here? That right here is fine. Whatever you uh, feel comfortable with. Oh, yeah, there's the little ticket. Yep, sure. Thank you so much, sir, for your Have generosity and a wonderful day. Yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God, babe. What happened? I dropped my phone, didn't check the door. <laughs> oh, wow. This is amazing here. This is, I think, this is a good idea. Let's see if we're too late. Oh, what happened? What happened? Chicago fire depth. Someone, someone inside it. So here is so beautiful, guys. Greeny, greeny. We're cold, man. This oh. Yesterday started out like this and then the north wind came in. I don't know where you were. I was standing right here and it went from here. We're gonna ride in the boat. Oh, the I experienced the boat driving. Well, you can I, see it from I there. Wasn't, I wasn't there, but I saw it. You didn't get the brunt. No. We're going now to sit there. Rita, if you so choose. Uh, so go visit our lovely bartender, Sylvia. She'll be able to get you squared away. Uh, and we'll get started in just a few minutes here. Yay! I'm excited! There's someone cleaning windows. Where? In that black, well, they're all black. Ah, uh, yeah, there, in the... Yep. Wow. They do need to go in the sky deck. <laughs> <laughs> There's more people. Oh, they're building that. Yeah, I see that. More people coming. Uh, feel free to come over to the top of the boat. It's already been drink out of, so ain't nobody gonna. Shoreline, Shoreline sightseeing, sightseeing. Yeah, there's 
exciting in Solnar, so we're excited. And this is the see guys, look at that. That's the view around, and there is one we're living. Ooh, oh my god! Bye guys, see you later. Uh, just wonderful. All right, so my name is Patrick. I will be your docent, that is your teacher, your guide here as we journey through the Chicago River. Uh, so first up, I do have a few quick safety announcements, if I can have your undivided attention, please. So first and foremost, we are a Coast Guard inspected vessel. That means that we carry life preservers for everyone on board. They clearly mark bins here and at the back of the boat. In the event of an emergency, your crew members will be able to help you with those. We have never had such an emergency, but just so you know, you will be safe if you're with us. Now we ask that you please do not stand or kneel on the benches at any time. Uh, and please keep your arms, your legs, all of your limbs inside the boat at all times, particularly when we're crossing underneath bridges. I know it will be tempting to reach out and touch those bridges, but it's a good way to lose a finger, so please do not do that. Uh, also, if you could please limit your side conversations for those who do want to hear the tour, and also just out of courtesy to your fellow passengers, if you could limit phone use to the back of the boat, that would be just wonderful. And finally, the Coast Guard does require that we wear masks on board. Um, we particularly just ask if you are moving about the vessel to keep your mask on, um, but we will not be hassling or the police about that, but just be asking for your cooperation with that. Thank you so much. Alrighty, so we are going to see some beautiful sights here today. We are going to see some amazing, amazing buildings. So get those cameras ready. Once we pass under that bridge over there, we're just going to be, the city is going to unfold before your very eyes. But we are also going to hear about the story of Chicago. And I want you to walk away knowing this, that the story of Chicago is a story of resiliency. It is a story of tenacity in the face of large problems or challenges. It is a two century long journey of self-improvement, of a city trying to make itself better and more beautiful for its citizens and visitors. We're going to use architecture to try to talk about that resiliency. And we're also going to hear some stories about things like a, uh, a great fire, fire uh, a world's fair, Plan, big plans, uh, river reversals, river beautification, um, and I'm going to use all of that to try to impress upon you this resiliency of, of Chicago, this resilient city that I live in. But we are also going to have exactly one boatload unit of fun, so whether you are from Chicago, from across the country, or across the world, you are now all on vacation, so please sit back, relax, get a drink from our bartender Sylvia, and enjoy your time here with us at Shoreline Sightseeing. So first up on the left, I want to point out Navy Pier, that area with the big Ferris wheel that maybe you visited already. That was built in 1916. It, uh, it was part of the 1909 well, Burnham plan that I'll talk about later on in the tour. And it was originally some barracks for World War I recruits, which is what led to being called Navy Pier. It then became a pilot training orientation for about 15,000 pi uh, pilots during World War II. It then was a campus for the University of Illinois. And in 1995, it turned into an entertainment and culture hub. There is a Tony Award winning Shakespeare Theater on that pier. There are restaurants, there are shops, there are exhibitions, there's a children's museum, and of course that beautiful, beautiful Ferris wheel. Now also behind us is Lake Michigan. Maybe you've seen this giant old backyard pond here. Lake Michigan is one of five Great Lakes, the others being Huron, Ontario, Erie, and Superior. Uh, it is the only Great Lake entirely within the United States. It stands at roughly 580 feet above sea level. The Great Lakes are an amazing freshwater source. They contain actually 20% of the world's fresh water. And now while the lake is green, that is due to algae, it's not pollution or anything like that. It's a very, very clean lake. But the Chicago River actually turns bright shamrock green for a holiday. Can anyone guess? St. Patrick's Day, that is right. So once a year, uh, every year since the 1960s, the Chicago Plumbers Union has been guiding the Chicago River bright, bright green in honor of St. Patrick's Day. And when I say bright green, I mean like blind your eyes, neon green. It is quite the sight to see, um, but I think it's really emblematic of how festive we get in Chicago. We really just love holidays here, whether it's in the neighborhoods during Halloween with cobwebs and uh, 
skeletons or Christmas time downtown with our Christmas lights and Christmas markets to Earth Day. No matter what the holiday is, we just love holidays here in Chicago. We go really, really hard for them. But we have come to the first building that I will talk about on the tour, probably one of my favorite buildings in all of the Chicago River, and that is the very tall, the very wavy St. Regis straight ahead of us on the left. Now the St. Regis uh, is the third oh tallest God. building in Chicago behind oh my these God, so beautiful. Towers, and it is the tallest building in the world designed by a woman-led architecture firm, Studio Gang. That's right, it's a design by local uh, Chicago star architect, that is, star architect, I'm sorry, I love a portmanteau, and, uh, pardon me, Jeannie Gang. So Jeannie Gang is literally a genius. She was awarded a 2011 Genius MacArthur Genius Grant, wow. and she has built buildings all over Chicago. But this one has 210 hotel rooms, 406 condos, and cost $900 million in this construction one? costs. Now the condos in that very tall, very wavy building range in price from $1 million for a one bedroom, a nice little studio, to $18.5 million for a four bedroom, four bath penthouse. Uh, so for all of you looking for a little starter home out there, I'll be pointing these out throughout the tour. Anyone who's in the real estate market, consider the St. Regis. Those upper floor units uh, are about 6,000 square feet. And the condos, they, when they were sold, they were sold as unfinished floors, so which beautiful. actually allows the owners to design their own floor plans, which is what is happening now. The building is completed, but all of the condo owners are designing their own floor plans. And I've been getting a lot of questions about those cables that you can see hanging off the building. That is, in fact, for window washing. There are some very brave souls that use those cables to wash the beautiful windows on the St. Regis. Now, near the top of the building, you'll notice that there is an empty floor where condos should be. That was on purpose, they didn't just forget to put them in, uh, and that is called a blow-through floor. A blow-through floor. How it works is, instead of windows and residences, you leave an empty row so that the wind can blow right through the building, oh. thus stabilizing the pressure on the windward side of the building oh, wow. and reducing building sway. It is one of uh, many ways that I'll point out here today of how to reduce building sway here in the Windy City. And now the blow-through floor does work, it works wonders, uh, but it is expensive. There's a bit of a tiff between the developers and the architect uh, because it, of course, cost the developers millions and millions of dollars and lost out condo space. Uh, but I think even though the developers might not be too happy, the residents will be more than happy to not get seasick. Now this building right here is the Swiss Hotel, that triangular looking building uh, by Swiss Harry Weiss. I think it looks a little bit like a so what you box. Yeah. So that's a Swiss chocolate box for a Swiss hotel. A little bit of uh, post-modernism and fun, which I'll be talking more about later on in the tour. And the Trump building! Alrighty. But I want to talk about this clock tower building straight ahead. That is the iconic, the iconic Ripley building, built in two parts in the early 1920s. You can tell because there's a bridge actually connecting the two buildings. Now this is a style of architecture. I'll be talking about a lot of styles here on the river today, but this style is called Spanish Revival style. Oh, Why? Spanish because Revival Because this style. building was actually modeled after La Giralda, which is a cathedral in Sevilla, Spain. Uh, that clock tower is, is a complete imitation of the cathedral in Sevilla. There are 250,000 glazed terracotta tiles of cream and white that draw your eye up. Terracotta is a material softer than porcelain that must be hand washed with soap and water every single year. Now this is the same Wrigley as in Wrigley Chewing Gum, as in Wrigley Field, go Cubs. Uh, and also fun fact, William J. Wrigley Jr., the chewing gum king, originally started out making soap and baking soap, uh, but he had this idea for a promotion during the 1893 World's Fair to include two free pieces of gum uh, with each can of baking soda. And the U.S. still did not have its own style of architecture yet. We were still copying and pasting European standards of beauty into our buildings. And it wouldn't be until later on in the 1920s that America finally got uh, a, an architectural style of its own that was finally uniquely American. As we pass under the beautiful DuSable Bridge, uh, named after Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, the first Chicagoan who I'll be talking about a little bit later on in the tour, we have come to one of the most spectacular buildings on the Chicago River, and that is Trump International Hotel. 
hotel and tower. So this is the second largest, second tallest tower in Chicago behind the Sears Tower. It stands at 1,389 feet. Wow. And it was built in 2009 by local Chicago star architect, Adrian Smith. Now, Adrian Smith has built buildings all over Chicago, but this one is a perfect example of a style known as contextualism. Contextualism. You take a site-specific design, custom-made for its environment. So you'll notice that there are three patios on this building, three setbacks. Those are not at arbitrary heights. Each setback corresponds to the height of a neighboring building. So this first setback right here corresponds to the height of the Wrigley Building. The second setback corresponds to the height of the Mather Tower across the river. And the third setback way out there corresponds to the height of this black box building, the AMA Plaza. So that's contextualism. You're trying to blend in with your environment, flatter your neighborhood. The silvery steel color is a nice smooth transition from the white of the Wrigley Building and the black of the AMA Plaza. And if you're looking for a little bit of a starter home, a penthouse sold for $17 million just wow. a few years ago. But coming up are one of the most photographed buildings in Chicago. Those are the Corn Cob Towers of Marina City. Why are they called the Corn Cob Towers? Well, they look like corn cobs. They really do. Now, back in the 1960s, there was a man, Bertrand Goldberg, and he wanted people to live in downtown Chicago. You see, in the 60s, nobody was really living downtown in Chicago. In fact, across the U.S., people weren't really living in city centers. They were living more on the outskirts, in the suburbs. And Bertrand Goldberg, he wanted to change all that. So what did he do? He built a utopian, vertically stacked world. He built a city within a city. Because in Marina City, you can have everything you need and live above the Chicago River. In those buildings, you will find restaurants, shops, a skating rink, a wow. bowling alley, a swimming pool. Wow. Whatever you can imagine, they probably have it there in Marina City. I think for us in pandemic times, these really must just be a quarantine so utopia. But over on the left, I want to point out this river walk area where those people are sitting and walking. That is a $112 million public amenity that zips together 1.3 oh, miles of Chicago River shoreline. And it's a perfect example of Chicago style resiliency because back in the early 2000s when this was being built, nobody was coming down to the Chicago level. River. The Chicago this River one. was not a destination for people. So what did the city do? This it is the one that we in walk. the future, it invested in beauty. Yesterday. And now, as you can tell, people are coming down to enjoy And this, this is the one that I hide. There are restaurants and shops all around the river. Uh, and people are more invested in the ecological health of the river than ever before. But over here on the left, I want to talk about this glass building with the uh, granite. That is 77 West Wacker. So you'll notice near the top of that building is a Greek style temple. Uh, so this is a style of architecture known as neoclassical. You take a classic design like the Parthenon and you update it using modern materials like glass and steel. The architect is a man named Ricardo Pofil, one of the few international architects here on the river. He is from Spain. Right. And I highly recommend coming down to the Clark Street Bridge at nighttime and seeing this architectural lighting on that building wow. at night. It is just gorgeous. Now this whole area, this whole neighborhood over here on your left is called The Loop. The Loop. Why is the loop? neighborhood called The Loop? Well, there is a, a public transportation system here in Chicago called the L, which stands for Elevated Train, which branches into all the different neighborhoods and then converges in the downtown area. And it literally makes a loop. Hence, Aww. this neighborhood being called The Loop, the financial district. And this area, this, this place that we call Chicago, that we are uh, located on now, is here because of this river that we are sailing on. You see, back in the 1800s, this was the waterway that connected the Great Lakes to the Mississippi River, thus connecting the East Coast to the Mississippi River. And we have been a center of trade ever since that time. We are also a city that respects its architectural heritage, which you can see over on the left with the Builders Building. Now you'll notice that this building was built in two parts. The first part on the left was built in 1927. The right-hand side was built in 1987. That is 60 years apart, but you'll notice that they're in the exact same style. And that's because they made the new addition to complement the historical part of the building. So that is respecting your architectural heritage. Similarly, with the Well Street Bridge, it looks pretty antique, right? With those vintage handrails and those cool-looking lamps. 
But this was actually an exact replica made eight years ago, brought down on a barge and bolted onto the side of the river to replace the early 1900s Wall Street Bridge. So again, we stay in conversation with our architectural past here in Chicago. But over on the right is the one, the only, the biggest boy of them all, the Merchandise Mart, or simply the Mart. So if that uh, building with the clock tower, the Wrigley Building, was looking back towards a European past, then the Merchandise Mart is looking forward to a bold American future dominated by machines. This is a style of architecture known as Art Deco, Art Deco, and it has all the classic features. Those dark inset windows, the streamlined verticality like racing stripes drawing your eye up, 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 telescoping towers, that polished Indiana limestone color, and simple repeated geometric shapes. This was a style for the roaring 20s, ornate, elegant, ostentatious. If each generation takes its values and expresses them in three dimensions, then the merchandise mark and art deco were expressing the Park luxury Street. and the optimism of the roaring 20s. Now, the Roaring Twenties came to a roaring halt, but I'll get to that a little bit later on the tour, because we have reached Wolf Point, where you can see 360 degrees of pure, reflective glass beauty. Now, let's start over here with this the one. main building, 333 Wacker. This is another example of contextualism, because you'll notice that the curve in the building matches the curve in the river, and the blue glass matches the blue of the sky, while the turquoise matches yeah. the green in the river. So that is contextualism as well. You're trying to harmonize with your natural context, fit in with the natural features of the area, in this case, our lovely river. And of course, the whole neighborhood just looks beautiful in this reflection, so that's flattering as well. Now this is where Ferris Bueller's dad uh, famously looked down on a parade in the 1980s Chicago documentary, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. But straight ahead is River Point. River Point. Uh, now many people think this looks a little bit like a McDonald's cherry pie box. Personally, I think it looks even more like a Hot Pocket. Yeah, McDonald's. Once you see that, you really can't unsee it. But that uh, archway at the bottom has two main Beautiful. functions. Number one, it works Beautiful. as a really amazing rain gutter for the entire building. But number two, it's so the building's caissons, its foundation, don't go so deep that they don't interfere with the train tracks, the Metro Amtrak line that is running underneath that building. Now this area, once again, is Wolf Point, the junction of the three branches of the Chicago River. And this was also the birthplace yeah. of Chicago. There was a That's train rich. right here in Wolf Point. And so this construction that you're seeing over here, this is really to breathe life back into the city's birthplace, to give life back to the origin of Chicago. Um, so it's another little bit of Chicago style resiliency. We're very excited for that tower to go on. But next up, I want to talk about Fulton House. That's that maroon colored building. Uh, that is the oldest building on the Chicago River from, uh, from 1898. Well, and it was originally a cold storage freezing building for the meat packing industry. Meat packing is one, one of our big exports in the early 1900s. We were called the hog butcher to the world, the city of broad shoulders. Uh, so basically how it worked is they would bring barges of beef from the south side, freeze them in Fulton House, and then ship them to export across the country. Now, meat packing went away in the 1970s, and when they were turning this building into condos, they say that it took three months for this building to thaw out, and that when they were knocking down the walls, they found that they were filled with matted horse hair and cork. So that is one way to insulate your building. But next up on the left is probably my favorite building in Chicago. Those oh, wow, are the river cottages uh, that were designed by Harry Wee. So you notice they look a little bit like a triangular design, right? And they have these porthole looking windows, almost like it's supposed to look a little bit like a sailboat. This is a bit of postmodernism. Form follows self-expression of the architect. Harry Weiss was an avid sailor, so he put these nautical themes into a lot of his buildings. Now, when Harry Weiss was building these river cottages, people thought he was crazy, and not just for the nautical theme. You see, back in the 1980s, nobody wanted to live on the north branch of the Chicago River. Whoa. The north branch was this stinky, gross industrial branch. Nobody wanted to live here. But Harry Weiss believed that if you build it, they will come. If you build something beautiful, people will be attracted to it and will want to come live there. And he was right. Just a few years ago, one of those river cottages sold for $2.25 million. Wow. But over here on the right is the East Bank Club, where you can see the old attitude towards the Chicago River. Because it looks a little bit like we're looking at the back of the building. 
That's because we are. It's almost like it's treating the river as its alleyway, turning its back on the river. But this was the old attitude. Nobody wanted to look at the river, let alone live on it. But as you can see over on the left, there are beautiful, beautiful yeah. canals being built down here now, and everyone is jockeying to come live down oh, here. Oh, they have the someone watering the plants. Apple and zip codes in the city. Look, she's watering the plants. Alright, so we are going to make a quick little U turn here, give you a chance to go to the bathroom, stretch your legs, get a drink from our bartender, Sylvia, uh, and I will be back on the mic in just a couple of minutes. Philadelphians in the house? Yeah! We got one! Woo! Um, but I moved here for school, and I decided to stay. And one of the reasons I did uh, was because I loved all the green space in Chicago. You'll notice we're surrounded by all these lush green trees, this lovely grassy area over here. Yeah. Oh, we're getting that beautiful breeze. It's beautiful. Um, and so I think that's really emblematic of how the green space is woven into the fabric of Chicago. Whereas in a place like the East Coast where I'm from, you've got uh, densely packed urban areas, and then of course you've got beautiful parks, like Central Park in New York City. But in Chicago, our green space is more interwoven into the fabric of the city. And so the city feels a little bit more spread out, a little bit more breathable for that reason. And that's just one reason why I, I fell in love with Chicago. But I want to talk about these bridges we're headed towards. I want to talk about that raised bridge. That is the Carroll Street Railroad Bridge. It is a 1908 landmark bridge that uh, exposes how Chicago-style bridges work. It's basically a seesaw design. It's called a trunnion bascule bridge. That's the technical term. However much steel you have on one side, you need that much concrete to counterweight it on the other side. Um, that's how all Chicago bridges work. That's why they call them Chicago style. And you can actually see that giant piece of concrete, the giant hook of concrete, that's the counterweight system. Yeah. And what I love about this is that this, the design is so specific that even a fresh coat of paint could completely throw off the measurements. Now this bridge uh, now is permanently raised. It only closes once per year for maintenance purposes. Really just to prove, hey, we still work. Yeah. But straight ahead, I want to talk about that Y-shaped building that looks a little bit like a pencil stuck into the ground. That is 150 North Riverside. 150 North Riverside. It is from 2017. It is a style known as Next Gen Contemporary. Next Gen Contemporary. Why? Because the style is so new, it is so contemporary, that the next generation will be the ones to name it something way, way. But I like to think of it as the iPhone of architecture sleek and elegant on the outside, but jam-packed with cutting-edge technology on the inside. Now, this was built by the Gesh Partners. You'll notice... So that's why you have this Y-shaped design. So the base of that building is amazingly only 39 feet wide. So here's an engineering problem. You've got a skinny office building with an even narrower base in the Windy City. You are going to deal with building sway again, right? And when buildings sway, people tend to get nauseous. So what do you do? Here's what they did at 150 North Riverside. They used a technology known as inertial slosh dampers. I'm sure you're all super familiar, but in case you're not, inertial slosh dampers work like water in a bucket. When the building sways in one direction, 160,000 gallons of water in 12 tanks at the Look top at this, of the building sloshes in the other direction to correct for the sway. It's basically like a giant water shock absorber. The inertia creates this balancing pull. liquid force that is able to dampen the oscillation and bring the building yeah, back to rest. How the bottom is super narrow. Yeah. Sloshed. Yeah. Super wide. yeah. One thing I love about this building is we always look really good. Make it Hi, us. Um, <laughs> we're so good looking. <laughs> but over here on the right, I want to talk about this glass building straight ahead. That is the Bank of America building. Now, people often ask, uh, how long does it take to build one of these enormous skyscrapers, and how much does it cost? Well, in this case, it took only about three years, just three years, to put up that enormous, enormous skyscraper. And it cost about $700 million in construction costs. Now, they also had to deal with that 30-foot setback for a river walk, and they did so in an interesting way. They used these huge tripod things that are literally vaulting the building wow. in mid-air. Those are huge steel I-beams that wow. are suspending the building so uh, over the river, allowing for that river walk area to exist. Such a, just a modern feat, uh, uh, an amazing feat of modern this is the tallest purely commercial building in Chicago. But we are going to jump into our time machine 
because these next five buildings on the right were all built in chronological order, and they really exemplify the evolution of architecture here in Chicago. So first up, we have Two Riverside Plaza. It's another example of Art Deco. You've got those deep inset windows, the streamlined vertical lines, uh, that uh, Indiana limestone color, pink roaring 20s. Now this was originally the Chicago Daily News building, one of our newspapers. Uh, and there actually are some base reliefs of important events from journalistic history, like the invention of the printing press there. But remember, what happened in 1929? The stock market the <laughs> <sighs> crashed. And we entered the Great Depression. And there is a virtual freeze on the building of office buildings from 1932 to 1957. 25 years without building. But when they reboot architecture in the late uh, 1950s, we jump right Street. into black box modernism, which you can see over on the right with gateway centers one and two. Black box modernism, form follows function. The father of this style of architecture was a man named Mies van der Rohe. Mies van der Rohe, who is another local Chicago star architect living right here in Chicago, and he famously said that less is more. There is an elegant simplicity to the black box. Dark, stark, cheap, and easy to make. These buildings are functionally beautiful instead of being aesthetically beautiful. And their design exposes their very skeleton and their purpose, which was to be an office building. But you might be asking yourself, you know, why build like this? How do we go from the ornate decadence of Art Deco to building squares on squares? Well. You have to remember that this was the post-World War II generation, the post-Great Depression generation. These people were naturally thrifty, and they didn't want to waste money on ornate office buildings. You know, they weren't worried about how many gargoyles are going to go on the top of their building. They said building boxes, but now they can have a little bit more decoration, a little bit more flair in the form of precast concrete or stone cladding. And the buildings can even be gas white. Very, very exciting, right? Now this style is called international style because you can see this style of building being built anywhere in the world in the 1970s. Yeah, mine, right along mine. to my personal favorite decade, the 1980s. That very, with the Gateway Center 4, that uh, glass curvy That's building beautiful. over there. So in the 1980s, architects are tired of building boxes. They don't want any more of these squares. They want to jump out of the box. And they were also a generation that was trying to teach people to get along in an ever-changing world. So contextualism is born. You'll notice, you can see the previous generation of architecture in the bubbled convex glass reflected back. And the curve in the building matches the curve in the river. And the greenish-blue glass matches the color of the river as well. So again, that is contextualism. You're trying to harm harmonize with your neighborhood, play along well with your neighbors. But over here on the left is a black box building that we never really used to talk about too much, and that made the owners kind of mad. And so they spent $800,000 to literally put themselves on the map. This is a giant you are here map of the Chicago River, and that red Lego piece actually represents this building on the Chicago River. And you can even see our beautiful grid system depicted. So, you know, if you're ever lost in downtown Chicago <laughs> and, you know, you drop your phone in the river, you can just look up at that building yeah. and you know exactly where to go, right? <laughs> right. But over here on the right, I want to point out this enormous, enormous Art Deco building that you might recognize if you are a Batman fan. Because this is where Heath Ledger's Joker robbed a Gotham City bank in the 2008 film The Dark Knight. If you recall the movie, he drove a school bus full of cash. Yep straight out of this building. Now this was the old main post office. The Batman right. from the Dark Knight was filmed there. Post office, oh, wow. they might be thinking, uh, uh, well, they had the, the, the bank heist. Yeah. Post office. Well, back in the 1900s, the, the Chicago was actually the mail order catalog capital of the world. We had the likes of Montgomery Ward here, and of course later Sears department store, and we actually needed a, a, a post office this huge to accommodate all of this ingoing and outgoing It's a post mail. office. Oh. People are, oh no. And nowadays this is uh, renovated into office space. There is Uber there, Home oh, Chef, uh, Walgreens, just to name a few. And there is also a four acre rooftop park on the top of that building, which I'm just dying to sneak up into. So if you know any tenants, let me know. Alrighty. As we say, 
sailed around the... So here's the first story. The Great Chicago Fire of 1871. You've maybe all heard about this fire in one way or another, right? Pretty famous fire. Remember how they talk but about Chicago about Fire? It, yeah. We first need to separate the facts from the fiction. Well, let's start with the fiction. It is an apocryphal tale that goes a little bit like this. In 1871, a cow in Mrs. O'Leary's barn cow? got spooked and intentionally kicked over a kerosene lantern that started the whole barn on fire and soon the whole city on fire. Mrs. O'Leary and the cow are tried in court and found guilty of causing the greatest urban inferno of all time. Maybe that sounds a little bit familiar. Well, it's mostly bogus. Now it is true that Mrs. O'Leary, an Irish Catholic immigrant, did have a barn. And it is true that she had a cow. And it is true that we believe the fire started in her barn. But there is no proof whatsoever to pin it on the cow or Mrs. O'Leary or anyone else for that matter. Uh, but you know, the city was angry after the fire. They wanted a scapegoat, so it settled for a scapegoat cow. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I had to do it. It had to be done. Uh, but here are the facts. In the mid-1800s, and our building was trying to keep pace with that growth. But the problem was we were building everything out of wood. And when I say everything, I don't even mean just buildings. I mean sidewalks too, all of it made out of wood. So I think you can see where this is going. Around 9 p.m. on October 8, 1871, a fire started in Mrs. O'Leary's barn, just a few miles to your right. That fire raged for three days. Whoa. destroyed 17,000 buildings, Whoa. left over 100,000 people homeless and propertyless, and tragically killed 300 people. 3.5 square miles of the city burnt to a crisp, the largest urban fire of all time. Oh my God. High winds in the Windy City were able to yeah, create fire that. tornadoes that jumped the Chicago River twice adjusted for inflation there was about four billion dollars in property damage this was an epic disaster that made headline news across the world but remember how i told you that chicago is resilient this fire was the worst and the best thing to ever happen to chicago because it meant that the city needed to rebuild itself and reinvent yeah. itself architects like Louis Sullivan flocked to Chicago from across the country and they learned from Chicago's mistakes building out of steel frames instead of wood. The rebuilding started the very next day and it has not looked back since. Just 15 years later, a man named William LeBaron Jenny would build the very first skyscraper ever, steel frame skyscraper, right here in Chicago. We would not be the same city that we are today without that great Chicago fire. You see, before, this, before the fire, the city was constructed haphazardly, without much design and with poor technology and materials. But after the fire, we were redesigned with intentionality, with better design, better technology, better materials, and we have become a much better city for it. Uh, debris from that fire was even used to build up our historic lakefront. We don't have that lake that we have today without the fire. So Chicago is often called the second city. That is Chicago 2.0, the city that rose like a phoenix from the ashes of a fire. Here's the second story, the 1893 World's Fair. So, just 22 years after the Great Chicago Fire, uh, Chicago has rebuilt itself and it wants to show off to the world and it wins the bid to host the 1893 World's Fair. And the city put in charge a man named Daniel Burnham, one of the most important Chicagoans ever, to oversee the construction of the fair. Now it was down in Jackson Park on the south side of Chicago uh, and it was called the White City. 220 temporary buildings imported and painted white, made to look like Venice in a beautiful open campus. It was a beautiful sight meant to inspire people with its beauty. But it also was the host of a number of important inventions. We have the first Ferris wheel, the introduction of Cracker Jacks, of Juicy Fruit Gum, the zipper, 
where would we be without the zipper? Uh, you have the first use of alternating currents, the first use of spray paint, uh, the first uh, elevated train, Pabst Beer won a blue ribbon at the 1893 World's Fair, and of course my personal favorite inventions, the brownie and the popcorn machine. For six months, 26 million people came through the turnstiles, and they went home across the world and telling people about Chicago's beauty. And I think the real lasting effect of the fair was that the wide open campus design inspired other urban planners to go home to their own cities and build wide open, beautiful spaces. That fair put Chicago back on the map, perhaps for the first time, as a world-class city. And it gave Chicagoans a taste for even more beauty. Here's the third story, the 1909 Plan of Chicago. So in 1909, the city goes back to Daniel Burnham and they say, hey Burnham, we want you to create a plan that will accommodate 50 years of population growth here in Chicago. And Burnham is like, you betcha, because he has a vision. He wants to make Chicago the Paris on the Prairie. Big boulevards, monuments, wide open green spaces. He wants Chicagoans to live in a city in a garden. That's where we get our Latin motto, herbs in Horto. Thanks in part to Daniel Burnham's plan, we now have over 600 parks in Chicago. Nearly 10% of our land space is green, and many of our 77 neighborhoods are actually named after parks, the largest being Lincoln Park. Here's what else was on the plan that helped shape the face and the character of the city. The museum campus. Grant Park, Buckingham Fountain, that Navy Pier, that river walk that we saw earlier where people were congregating for public transportation, public spaces, and my favorite part about it, a preserved recreational lakefront. Thanks to Daniel Burnham, we now have 26 miles of unobstructed lakefront. Oh, that's the one that we go? Free from industry for everyone to, I want to enjoy. Take so I hope that these three stories have helped to illuminate this resiliency, this tenacity in the face of large problems. I like to say that the fire destroyed the fair inspired, and the plan dreamed. In the 150 years, to the year, since the Great Chicago Fire, we have been working tirelessly to make Chicago a better, more beautiful place. Now speaking of making Chicago a better, more beautiful place, remember Bertrand Goldberg, uh, the man who built those corn cob looking towers of Marina City? Well, over here on the right, you have its cousin, River City. This is yet another uh, city within a city, a utopian world, where you can have everything you need and live above the Chicago River, including, as you can see, space for your boat. So for all you boaters out there, considering a nice little starter home, consider oh, wow. River City as an option. Now this curvilinear structure was originally supposed to form a serpentine community unraveled along the base of, or along the banks of the Chicago River, but unfortunately phase one was the only one ever completed. But I think it still adds just such a cool, interesting design that you don't see anywhere else here on the Chicago River. Alrighty, we have reached the royal family here in Chicago. We have the king, the Sears Willis Tower, that very tall building with the white antennas. We yeah. have the queen, 311 South Wacker, that peach octagonal building with the barrel crowns. And we have the prince, the Chicago Board of Trade building, that building with the statue on top. We was Let's there, start babe. With that one. So the Chicago we Board of Trade there. building is another example of Art Deco. See those deep inset windows, that streamlined verticality? Think Roaring Twenties. Now, that sculpture on top is actually an example of Art Deco sculpture, and it was made to be faceless, and that is for two reasons. Number one, that was sort of the style of the day. You'll notice it's similar to the Oscar statue, the Academy Award, that is similarly streamlined and faceless. But also, when that building was built, it was the tallest building in Chicago in 1930. And so the sculptor thought, no one's gonna look at this face anyway. So I'm not gonna put it on there, no one's gonna be able to see it. Well, nowadays, from many vantage points, we can tell that it is indeed a faceless statue. But that statue is of Ceres, that's the Roman goddess of agriculture, and that's because the original purpose of the Chicago Board of Trade Building was to trade agricultural futures, where they made a lot of money. Next up, we have the Queen, 311 South Wacker, that peach octagonal building with the barrel crowns. So in 1990, when that building is built, uh, those crowns were actually yeah, illuminated at night by 1800 fluorescent tubes. Now nowadays they are illuminated mostly by LED lights, but they ran into an interesting problem where the lights on that building were so bright that they were actually confusing the migration patterns of birds. These birds thought the building was so bright that they thought it was the moon, and they were flying right into the building, or flying around the building, 
and tiring out. Yeah, terrible, right? You know, we in Chicago, we love our bird friends. So nowadays, those lights are dimmed during the bird migration seasons, so no birds were harmed during the construction of this tour. But next up, we have the one, the only, the tallest building in Chicago, the King, the Sears Willis Tower. So in 1974, Sears Department Store built the tallest building in the world, right here in the Windy City. You are going to deal with that building swing problem again, right? Well, to accommodate it, they actually built nine buildings in one. Three buildings by three buildings in a neat little grid. The concept is called bundled columns. Each column is 75 feet by 75 feet, grouped or bundled together. If you think about an unsharpened pencil, if you try to stick one of those up in the air, it's probably gonna fall over, right? It's gonna blow over pretty easily. But if you group or bundle a bunch of unsharpened pencils together, they are more likely to stand up straight. It's the same concept right here. Now that building stands at 1,451 feet, that is 442 meters. Uh, and you might be asking yourself, how exactly do you measure the height of a tall building? Well, the Council on Tall Buildings, yes, that is a real thing, says that you measure the height of a building from the threshold of the door of the lowest open air entrance to the top of the structure. stands at a very patriotic 1776 feet in New York City. And the tallest building in the world is the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, yeah. which stands at over 2,700 wow. feet. It is an incredibly tall building. You should Google a picture of it, the Burj Khalifa. Burj Khalifa. It. it is insane to look at. It goes into the clouds. Um, so the Sears Tower or the Willis Tower, maybe you've heard both used. Well, Sears left in the 1990s, unfortunately, and the naming rights of the building came up for lease in 2009, when they started to be leased by the company Willis, which is an insurance brokerage firm. And so, uh, it is technically the Willis Tower, but, you know, Chicagoans, they are, they are nostalgic, they are stubborn, and so if you ask a Chicagoan, what's the name of that tower, they are bound to say it's Sears the Sears Tower. tower. But just so you know, the Sears Tower is the Willis Tower. Oh. Now, my favorite fun fact about these towers uh, is that it, it was successfully climbed twice. The first time was by an American named Dan Goodwin, who climbed that building uh, wearing a Spider-Man costume, super cool, and using suction cups. And the second time it was climbed was by a Frenchman named Alain Robert, who did it using no equipment. He free soloed he was the there. face of the Sears Willis Tower. And for this, we call we was the there. French Spider-Man. Both there. men made it successfully to the top of the tower and back down safely, and both men were successfully we was there. arrested. So I do not recommend climbing that tower. It will not end well for you. But those glass boxes near the top that you can just barely see right up there at the top, those are called the ledge, the ledge. The so ledge. there's a sky deck up in that tower where you can go up and you can stand in these glass boxes and you can look down at over 1,000 feet to the ground. It is terrifying, in my opinion. I'm very afraid of heights, uh, so when I did this, I nearly fainted. But you all are much braver than me, so I'm sure you would love to check out that beautiful, beautiful view of the Chicago skyline. So consider going to the ledge in Sears Willis Tower. All right, so let's talk some Chicago nicknames. That is, that stand directly side by side. But that is how they build all over on the East Coast, all tightly jam-packed together. Now, how does that make you feel? A little bit tense? A little congested? A little bit uh, competitive, maybe? Well, compare that to what you see over on the left. There is room for these buildings to breathe, which in turn allows you to breathe. Now, how does that make you feel? A little more relaxed, a little more easygoing. Scotty Pippen, Alice Cooper, and allegedly, this one is only a legend, I like to say it anyway, Oprah Winfrey allegedly had a, had a apartment at the top of that tower. Some people think it looks 
little bit like a flask with that disc on top. Personally, I think it looks even more like a fidget spinner. That toy that you're like probably obsessed with for a while. Cologne, uh, all right, so this, this patch of grass over here, this is going to become Du Sable Park. And it gives me a great opportunity to talk about Jean-Baptiste Pointe Du Sable. Uh, he was the first non-native settler of Chicago. He is known affectionately as the first Chicagoan. Um, and he was of African and French descent, born in modern-day Haiti. So he also was Chicago's first immigrant. And he, sta he established a trading post here in the 1780s. So way before Chicago was even incorporated, Chicago wasn't incorporated until about 50 years later, he established a trading post that became a major supply station for traders in the Midwest region. I'll come right over and I'll take your picture. Um, all right, and I'll see you in just a couple minutes. Lived here for how long? Way down. One hour and a half, one hour and 15 minutes. Chicago Fire Department. Just be careful, baby. We're getting close to them. Oh, I saw it. Watch out for that guy. Fairs to river reverses to river beautification. It is a resilient city that is constantly trying to do better for its citizens and its visitors. I think for all of us in the past year and a half or so, you know, we've faced some incredible challenges uh, as a country, as a nation, as a, as a world. Um, and I think we can all take a page out of Chicago's book to keep doing our part to make the world just a little bit better, a little bit more of a more beautiful place. So on behalf of Shoreline Sightseeing, I want to thank you so much for going on this journey here with me today. Uh, this is actually just my first week on the boat, and you all have been such a wonderful crowd. Wow. So thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of your time in sweet home Chicago. Thank you. Yay! You have to pay for the encore. <laughs> they said one more. He's so smart. He memorized everything. I guess it's really...